Welcome back to another Friday Q&A where I answer questions submitted by our Ultra supporters through the YouTube channel. Just got a few of them today. I'm going to summarize and paraphrase these just for the sake of time, and I'm going to go ahead and get started. First question was essentially, why do I constantly feel like I have to do two things at once? I can't just watch TV or I can't just be on my phone. I have to be doing both. And the person who submitted this question related the onset of this problem to a period of significant depression. So this is this is common. It's also a con it, it's not a complicated question, but the answer could be complicated because there are many, many reasons why a person may experience that pattern. I'm going to give you what I think are probably my top three possibilities for why that might be. And conveniently, all three of these could essentially be addressed with the same coping skill. So if you're constantly needing to multitask, meaning like you need multiple stimuli going on around you to stay engaged, that could mean simply that you are understimulated, meaning it could be that the things you're doing on the television, on your phone, book you're reading, maybe they're not that interesting to your brain. Maybe you're not that engaged by them. So you sort of have this threshold, right, of how interesting a thing needs to be to capture your attention. And maybe the things you're doing only get you like halfway or two thirds the way that threshold. So this stimuli by itself just doesn't fully capture your attention. But when you stack two of them on top of each other, cumulatively, they provide enough stimulation to engage you. It is pretty common that our need for stimulation goes up as we age because our brains continue to grow and develop. And the more cognitive ability we have, the higher that threshold becomes. So some of this is just typical with age. Um, and it's also possible that what interests you may be changing. This is something that's happened to me several times in my life where there, there used to be certain stimuli, certain activities where I could just lose myself in them and, and they would capture my full attention. And at some point, they just kind of lost that capacity. That, that doesn't mean I don't enjoy them at all, but they don't completely suck me in like they used to. Uh, video games for me are a really good example of that. I used to be able to lose myself for hours in a video game. Um, even watching someone else play it was stimulating enough for me to lose myself for hours. And now my attention span um, for gaming by myself basically is zero. And even uh, as a social activity, it's pretty, pretty low. So it's possible that for one reason or another, you're experiencing some level of understimulation. Second reason, and maybe the most likely given the onset of this pattern that you described, is that this could be an expression of anhedonia. I know it's something we've covered on the channel a lot, but just to briefly review, anhedonia is typically a symptom of depression, and it's essentially when your, re your reward pathway is disrupted, so you don't experience as much enjoyment or engagement from the things that you do as you normally would. And so your life can feel kind of boring or uninteresting, and you're just, you're just not really that into anything that you do, even things you normally would be quite into. So it could simply be an expression of anhedonia. Anhedonia does create it's kind of the same answer, but a different explanation because anhedonia does tend to create this chronic sense of understimulation, but it's for a different reason. The third possibility, and I'm separating these out, but like it could be some mix of two of these. It could even be some mix of all three. Um, but the third really likely reason I can think of is stress. When we're really stressed out, it takes more to pull us out of the stress. So if you've got a lot going on, at work or at home or with your health or, or whatever, those things are going to be on your mind a lot. And for a leisure time activity like television or books to engage you, it has to pull you out of your stress. And so the more stress you are under, the more engagement you need to pull you out of it because it essentially has to be a more interesting uh, stimuli than what's happening inside your mind. And if what's happening inside your mind is a lot and stress tends to feel very important to us because we have that negativity bias that causes us to interpret unpleasant emotions as being more important than pleasant emotions, the more stressed out you are, the more stimulation you will need to distract from your stress. So that being said, whether it's one of those, multiple, all three, I think the key here is you might need to switch it up a little bit. Something we talk about a lot in intensive outpatient programming are the three components of a healthy or a skillful distraction. And they are high stimulation, low stress, and novel. Let me just break that down for you in a little bit more detail. 
by stimulation kind of goes back to our first theory under stimulation, right? Basically means you have to be into this thing. There are a lot of things that we do um, for leisure time that aren't actually very stimulating. My stereotypical example that I think of every time is the show House Hunters, which I don't even know if it's on anymore. That's probably a very dated reference. But House Hunters is like, at least to me and to most people I know, it's a background show. You don't put House Hunters on when you want to be completely zoned in on your television for half an hour. Because unless you're like maybe a realtor or something, it's not that compelling. You're just watching people look at houses. There's no real major plot line to follow. And you can kind of dip in and out as far as your attention goes and still generally know what's going on. So try to avoid doing like background type activities and try to pick things that are really stimulating or interesting to your brain. Things that really suck you in and that tend to kind of grab your full attention. That's what a high stimulation task is. Um, low stress just basically means you're not super concerned about the outcome of this thing. So if it's um, if you're if you're painting for um, for downtime, that's fine unless you are like trying to sell your paintings on Etsy or something like that. If there's some you know financial or performance expectations attached to the activity, it's going to tend to be high stress. And something that's high stress can't effectively distract you from stress because it just creates more stress. So it has to be something where you don't really have any expectations attached to it. And no matter how it goes, you know, you're going to be okay. It's not really going to affect your mood or your day. And that third piece, novelty, just means you got to switch it up every now and then. Our brains really acclimate when we do the same things over and over again. So if you can find ways to kind of break up the monotony of life and even if it's the same type of activity, like even if you're still watching TV and watching TV is your main like leisure time activity, just watch something totally different. Watch a different type of show, a different channel than what you normally would. Our brains tend to get very bored very quickly when there's a lot of routine and mundaneness. So novelty is super important there. Next question was around driving anxiety. Uh, the person who submitted this question said they currently cannot drive. They felt that this was very unusual, and I kind of picked up on the sense that maybe they were pretty embarrassed about it, and they want to know how a person might be able to, to conquer driving anxiety. Let me start by saying this. It's a common one. You are not alone in that. Um, I'm sure some of this depends on where people live and things like that, too. I think driving is really stressful. And that's part of why I don't live in a very big city because when I did, I hated driving even more than I already do. I have done driving, uh, driving exposure therapy with several people in individual therapy. In fact, it's such a common one that this is the example I use in my workbook that I'm currently working on for hierarchical exposure therapy. So you are not alone. Please do not over pathologize yourself. Driving is stressful. Driving is hard. And this is a very, very common source of anxiety for many people. In terms of how I would overcome it, it's really uh, going back to, again, hierarchical exposure therapy. I've done a whole video on this, um, but I'll briefly break it down here. It means you take this activity, so driving in this case, and you kind of break it down to lots of smaller components and you practice just doing each one individual part at a time for a long enough period of time that your anxiety fades. Anxiety cannot persist indefinitely in the absence of an actual threat or problem. So if you have driving anxiety and you first get into a car, especially if you're in like the driver's seat, your anxiety is going to spike because something inside of you is saying, this is dangerous. This is bad. We shouldn't do this. But if you can ride out that anxiety, if you, if you can stay in the situation and nothing bad happens to you, eventually your system will start to calm down. And if you do that enough times, eventually your limbic system and your nervous system recognize and acknowledge that this isn't actually as scary as we thought it was. But, I, but in terms of how I'd break that down, I'll give you like a super quick overview here. Maybe I would start by just getting in the past, the, I'm sorry, the driver's seat of a car and you don't even turn the car on. Like you're literally just sitting in the driver's seat. It's off, it's in the garage or the driveway or whatever. It's not moving. The keys aren't even in the ignition. It has no capacity to move. You're just getting used to being in that physical location. And again, like I just said, it's gonna spike your anxiety at first. As you sit there and nothing happens and nothing will happen because the car is not even on, 
your system is going to relax and it's going to say, okay, I don't think anything's going to happen here. And you do that repeatedly. You don't just do that once and then move on. You keep doing just that once, maybe twice a day for however long it takes to ride out that wave of anxiety. And at some point, what you're going to notice is when you get in that car, it doesn't really spike very much in the first place. Your 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 inner defense system essentially has recognized this isn't that bad. We can do this. This is all right. And then you're going to increase the difficulty by one level, right? So that could be you can you be the judge of how much you break it down. Obviously, that could just be putting the keys in the ignition. That's going to change the stimuli. It's going to make lights come on. That's going to create sound, right? Cars are different. They look and function differently when there's keys in the ignition versus not. It could mean turning the car on, which is leaving it in park. So, you know, you got to decide how many different levels you want to break this down into. But that's the idea is that you increase the difficulty by a small amount when you recognize that the level you're currently on doesn't really provide much difficulty for you. And you go one step at a time. So eventually you're driving and you're going to start maybe driving, maybe backing in and out of the driveway, maybe driving around the block, and you're going to just gradually expand your range. And if you do that with patience, and with time, you should get to a point where the amount of anxiety caused by all but the most extreme driving scenarios are minimal. It might take a while, but that's okay. Third question was around being able to tell the difference between excitement and anxiety and how a person with a chronic anxiety disorder might tend to overinterpret any kind of increase in energy as excitement, or I'm sorry, as anxiety. I, um, I spoke a little about this one before, but I'll try to explain it differently because I think I maybe didn't do a great job before. This again is a common problem because excitement and anxiety have a lot in common. They both involve a significant increase of energy and activation of the adrenal system. So they actually do feel pretty similar in terms of they're going to create this kind of ramping up feeling for you. Big difference is going to be what direction they pull you in, right? So you think of this certain stimuli. There's, there's an event that's going to be happening or something like that, that creates this rise in energy for you. Excitement is going to be energy towards, like you're going to feel pulled to or driven towards that thing. Like, I want to do that. I can't wait for it. I'm anticipating it. I feel good about the fact that this is coming up on the horizon. Anxiety is going to be that same, a, a very similar feeling increase in energy, but it's going to be energy away from. So I have this spike in energy and I want to get away from the thing causing it. Um, or if it's a thing I can't get away from, it's like, I can't wait for it to be over because the amount of anxiety that's causing in me right now is difficult to sit with. So you do have a lot of common ground. Now, the other thing that I think makes this difficult is that in addition to feeling similar, I think most situations that create excitement create at least a little bit of anxiety. And most situations that create anxiety create at least a little bit of excitement. Because like, if you're anxious about something, that means you care about it, right? If you truly did not care at all about something, it wouldn't cause you a lot of anxiety because you would, it goes back to that low stress idea from our first question. If you don't care what happens here, you're not going to have a lot of stress or anxiety associated with it. But anything that's exciting probably brings at least some level of like, oh, I hope this actually goes the way I want it to. And that can create anxiety. So I think in most cases, you're going to feel both. One might be more dominant than the other, but but I think it's I think it's a rare situation where you'd only feel one like a hundred percent exclusively. What you'll probably often find is that you kind of oscillate or ping pong back and forth, excitement being primary versus anxiety being primary. Like a good a good example for me is when I have a presentation to give when I'm doing public speaking, that creates probably a 50 50 split in me of excitement versus anxiety and it, it it'll kind of waver like which one is dominant like i'll i'll think about it and i'll get really excited and oh, it's gonna be fun i'm gonna get to like teach people and help them and then it's like oh but what if i screw it up what if someone doesn't like what i say what if my pants fall down you know just you know, the usual stupid stuff you think about and then it then i lean more towards anxiety and then i start thinking about the good stuff again and i lean back more towards excitement so it's also normal to be very divided and kind of go back and forth between those emotions but in general it's the direction of your energy and whether you're feeling pulled towards or away from a thing or whether you're excited for the actual event or if you're excited for the event to be over if you're excited for the event to be over that probably means that your feelings about the event itself is more anxiety 
Last question, and this one's just a fun personal question, which I always appreciate. So thank you for those. Have you ever traveled outside the U.S. and it and or where would you like to travel in the future? This might sound dumb, but I don't know the answer to this question. The reason is I I don't think I've ever traveled outside the U.S. When I was about nine, ten, maybe, um, me and my dad and one of my dad's friends and his son, who was about my age, went to the Boundary Waters, which is so Minnesota Canada boundary. Um, I don't know if we technically crossed over into Canada or not. I cannot recall. Um, if we did, that would be the only time I've ever been out of the U.S. So I think the answer is probably no, because I don't think we went that far into the Boundary Waters. I doubt that we crossed over. Um, as far as where I'd like to go, I'm, I'm kind of boring, honestly. The only thing that I really care about as far as vacations is nature. Like I'm not, not a city guy. I'm, I don't really care about shopping. I'm not super into like museums and stuff like that. I mean, I like zoos, but I'd rather just go to like the actual place where the animals live than see them in a zoo. Um, so most, my dream vacation is Northern Minnesota, honestly, which I go to every year. It's I know it's not objectively the best place in the world, but I cannot imagine an area more perfectly designed for me and seemingly my kids too, based on how they've been reacting to it than that. I actually like to go to the same places over and over and over again because I like knowing where everything is. I like knowing where stores are. I like being familiar with the drive. When I go on a vacation to an unfamiliar place, like it takes me a few days to even orient to where I am. And a lot of times by then the vacation's over. So sometimes really new novel vacations are actually, it kind of goes back to the last question, excitement versus anxiety. Sometimes that leans more towards anxiety for me. Whereas if it's a more familiar location where I kind of know what I'm doing, that's going to be more exciting to me. That being said, knowing that I'm a nature lover, I'd love to go to Alaska someday. I would love to go to Montana someday. I would love to go to Canada someday. Um, I was talking with my daughter the other night. I went scuba diving once when I was a teenager, and it was a that was a tough time in my life, and it was like a rare highlight. I'd love to do that with my kids someday. Um, my wife lived in Texas for a while, and she says that's a pretty fun place. So I'd definitely be down for Texas. They have good barbecue. Um, but yeah, anywhere naturey, anywhere with like forests and streams and lakes, I'm down for. So that's kind of my short list. Thank you as always for the wonderful questions and I will see you guys next week. If you want to become a part of the question answering process, just check out the membership section of my YouTube channel and look into what it takes to be an ultra supporter. That's what this is all about. Take care. See you next time.